Now, speaking about the uh, St. Clair County Virtual Learning Academy, um, where do you see online learning is going to be taking education, not only here in Michigan, but internationally as well? You know, it's interesting. I, I had a chance to speak to architects and construction managers a few weeks ago. And normally we wouldn't, you know, we get asked to do a lot, and I would never do that. But I realized, I wonder if they get it. I wonder if they understand that if you keep building Taj Mahals that are cost, cost, costing taxpayers $80 million, and maybe all you're going to need is a $30 million building for a couple of reasons, that all the kids won't be in school all the time. That's becoming apparent. A lot of them are going to learn online at home or in other kinds of settings. And, and, and then are you really thinking differently about the classroom, not just putting a few more tools in a 900 square foot box? I mean, that's just putting, you know, perfume on this. It really isn't adjusting. And to my surprise, they really aren't up to speed on that. I'm, I'm generalizing here. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of it is the incentives for a lot of those folks you know, I don't mean this in a mean-spirited way, but they don't necessarily want to hear. Their fees are based on size and money. And I think we have to help educate each other that, that online learning is here to stay. It's going it, to, it's exponentially changing. You know, the abilities that we have now, we'll look back in five years and realize this is like, you know, the typewriter on a relative basis. So we're going to be at a point where I think, you know, th this is really going to change the world. I had a chance to... Uh, give some seat time waivers, as you know, as we've already talked, and one was to Genesee County. And then because we didn't have a way to get everything to scale right away, I told all the other ISDs that as long as you signed up kind of in the GenNet formula, the Genesee formula, that they could have that waiver. And, and up, so it scaled up large numbers of kids overnight. Talk about, you know, a function of a state superintendent, something that you can make a bold decision on. And and I think it's in the right interest of kids. Uh, it's going to change everything. There's always going to be professional teachers, and there's always going to be interaction with other kids at the school level because it, it, it's a big part of growing up is learning social skills and all the rest. But online's here to stay. Yeah. I have a granddaughter who's just completing the first grade, and it's kind of exciting to see how she's learning and what's happening in her young life. But how different do you think school's going to be when she graduates? And, kind of hard to say but in year 2022 I mean that's a number that's way out there but really it isn't that far away yeah Terry yeah, I have a new granddaughter also coincidentally and it, it what I don't I don't have any idea I mean I could guess but when I see how quickly you go from the iPhone to the iPad and whatever it'll be three months from now I, I, I you know it'll be kids in their contact lenses will have access I guess to the internet um, we have to think differently about testing as a result. People that freak out about, oh my gosh, what are we going to do when kids cheat because they have the iPhone and can ch check something out right away, it just means we have to change. They're not going to throw the iPhone away. This isn't going backwards. We have to change the way we assess. We have to change the way we think about learning. And, you know, honestly, I just, I don't think I could even guess because everything in history has been kind of a slow ascending improvement in education and this is exponential and and think about when we find out more about what I do believe we're going to find out more about is is how the brain develops and how you can encourage that in in, in different ways that are kind of outside the classroom I mean right this is a small example but we've known for dozens of years that kids should be reading all summer it's like the best thing they could do to nurture their mind get ready for the next school year and even that we're not able to get clear in our culture you know it's kind of like uh, summertime oh, the end of American Idol last night and one of the songs was about schools out for summer I think Alice what's his name and uh, Cooper I guess and so the culture hey schools out let's have fun well it's all over you know if we don't understand that learning has to be year-round and I think in terms of our grandkids um, I don't know that we can actually imagine it because I think if it's this dramatically changing under our nose right now with their ability to hold up an iPhone, point it at a place in the stars, get the real live constellations that they're looking at, move it over here, get a different constellation because of the GPS and everything else, then wait till fifth grade to teach the solar system. I mean, you know, they're already done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we've got, it's going to be very hard for us to adjust, but we're going to have to because they're moving ahead with or without us. 
Now, how do we uh, prepare our teachers to be teaching in that newer culture, newer type of environment when coming out of the higher education, they're being taught the same way that those professors were taught and learned in school? You know, that's a very good question. I just came out of a meeting where uh, I was reminded that I think it's in a week or two or a couple of weeks I'm meeting with the university presidents. And one of the things I'm going to say to them, so, you know, if they happen to see this, uh, no problem. They, they, they can know I'm going to bring this up. But it's like if, if, if they have asked their dean of education, what have you changed dramatically in the last few years, particularly given the new high school requirements where all kids need to learn algebra? Because most people have been trained to teach algebra to the so-called college-bound kids, right? Mm -hmm. So when, if, if they just ask that generic question, we want evidence of what have you changed dramatically? And if you're getting fuzzy answers, it means you're in trouble. And frankly, we renew or don't renew the teacher prep institutions. And I'm, I just signed a three-year contract. I'm determined you know, be tough on this, that we're not going to renew ability for these universities to do teacher prep unless they show that they're dealing with real life changes and how kids learn now and how to use technology in the classroom. And as you said, not be taught. I, I have great respect for older professors. I'm an old guy, so I, <laughs> I get that. But we have to adjust. And if they're not adjusting, they got to move aside. And our ultimate leverage frankly on this is these are these are these are things that good universities want to have for the right reason because it's prestigious to have a teacher ed institution but it's also you know brings revenue in so it's not changing quick enough to be blunt um, they need to stay on top of the research but that's the simple question I would ask a president to ask what give me an example of something dramatic that you have changed in the program in the last two years and if they can't give you an answer you're not you're behind Mm -hmm. Well, can't we uh, even ask the same question to our local districts as well? That's, that's a good point. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we just, I find I've done this a long time, and I'm not very good at this, actually. I sometimes, as I'm kind of doing now, I ramble on. Sometimes it's just asking the right question and watching to see how people answer it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not to catch them or a gotcha, but, I, but I'm serious, if a dean or a superintendent or a principal or, or frankly board members, I mean, I have a little, you know, I know I'm going to get some blowback on this because you have a wide audience, but, you know, I think sometimes what happens with boards, if I could just say this, is accountability is setting up very dramatically for removal of principals. They're going to be removed and fired from their job if they're in this reform district that we're putting together next year that under new state law where, where just schools will be taken over by state if they're not on the right on the ascending in the right way on the achievement and what I want to say about boards is we're all co accountable including me and if the if the student achievement in your district isn't going up it means you're not being bold enough as a, as a board member as a teacher as a principal superintendent we're all in this together and if we could just look at that not as a threat but as a challenge uh, and doing it as a team and not pointing fingers about you know in the next few weeks we're going to be letting out when we get approval from the feds what are called it's a, it's a, it is a horrible it's an unfortunate terminology but the feds call it the persistently lowest performing schools mm -hmm. and and when a school gets that label it's gonna really bring a lot down on them and it's really an opportunity because we have money to provide those schools to turn around. But let's face it, it's going to bring a lot of questions to the surface in communities that, especially if they're not communities that people typically think, you know, have schools that are low performing. Sure. And, and then and I hope what happens is people aren't pointing finger at each other and saying, what do we do to turn this around? <laughs>